Hello everybody. I am aware of my accent. So I apologize for that. Every time you cringe, remember I cringe with you. My name is Eugen Panferov. It tells you nothing so we can focus on the topic of this presentation which is the proposal of a data language. A pretty rare thing nowadays. How many new data languages have you met for the recent 30 years? Edgar Cord in 1972 stated his anticipation as follows. He expected in his near future a great variety of languages to be proposed for interrogating databases. 40 years passed. Where are they? He didn't think that SQL is the final solution for the problem. He considered his own child SQL to be a provocation for development. But it never happened. We decided that SQL is the final solution. And we developed the great divide, which I blame for this stagnation. Because it sounds good that we divide our problem into two sub-problems, algorithm representation and data representation. And we achieved quite a lot on the left side. I'm not satisfied with this development, but at least the, the, there is some development. And on the right side, on the data side, we basically reverted back to no formalism from a single unsatisfactory formalism for 40 years of stagnation and development we reverted back to everything maintained manually no formalism at all that's the state of affairs The problem is that this great divide is nonsensical. We can speak about two sub-problems of algorithm representation and data representation separately. But in reality, we cannot solve these problems separately. Because software is data manipulation. It is data manipulation and nothing more. So for, for the last 40 years, we were developing a single-sided coin. So my ultimate goal is to stop this nonsense and integrate an advanced data language into a general purpose language. Make it possible to speak about data in a general purpose language as a native part of this language. And I insist to use a relational data model for that. Not because of the SQL, but because the power of the relational model. Relational model seems to be all-encompassing. You can represent any knowledge any possible knowledge in the world you can represent as the hierarchy of relations and you are doing it every day as you speak about anything literally anything if something is speakable of by speaking about it you are automatically building a hierarchy of relations uh, this graph in particular on this slide doesn't represent anything but it doesn't represent anything particular except the possibility of an arbitrarily complex configuration of relations. But it took me 10 seconds maybe to scribe inside this perfectly random graph an abstract example. A man writes a book hastily. I started with a perfectly random picture. I, I drew it simply to to show you the possibility of 
complex configuration and then I scribed a concrete example into it in mere 10 seconds. And I have chosen intuitively understandable labels for for the tires of this for the stages of this hierarchy so 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 that you can understand how it maps onto your language and I hope you understand how your language maps onto the knowledge so we I choose relational model because it is powerful all-encompassing and complete but SQL approach to the data to the relational model SQL implementation of a relational model is extremely deficient it's, it's highly deficient absolutely unsatisfactory and I'm going to explain it to you well I'm sure half of you more than half of you already hate SQL and you are following the cult of no SQL I believe so I'm about to give you perfect justification for your hate for SQL What's the classical by the book SQL approach to data representation? We first draw an ER diagram. We call half of the relations entities and half of them, half of the relations we call relations, which seems to be a violation of, of the relational idea right from the start. Then we map this ER diagram classically by the book, I'm not inventing anything in this slide, into a couple of tables and a foreign key between them. All three objects represent a relation here. A table is meant to be a, a, a relation in SQL, but also a foreign key represents a relation. So right from the start we have two different representations for the same thing and the difference is deep the difference between this representation is the level of abstraction tables are fully maintained by the machine but the machine slightly helps you to maintain foreign keys but you need to maintain them themselves you need to maintain them you you need to give them meaning you need to imply meaning behind them. You invent fake type. Integer is not the type of category. So integer is already fake. You already lied to your machine about your data in this, in this very definition. And this category ID, integer category ID, will poison, will infect all of your input and output. And you have to deal with it every day. And the foreign key is the is only capable of representing mere one to many relations. A many to many relation which is more prominent in real life is not representable with the foreign key. It takes a link table, which is also a classical necessity of life. You cannot avoid link tables when you are projecting your knowledge into an SQL database. And we already have three different representations for for this for the for a relation. Foreign keys, link tables, and tables themselves. And these two are not variants of the same. This they they are fundamentally different representations. In case of foreign keys, a foreign key here on the bottom represents itself a relation. A foreign key employed with a link table on its own does not represent a relation. So, on top of the uh, multiple uh, dissimilar representations, we have another problem, an opposite, a uh, co complementary problem, that we are having two lexically and syntactically identical things in our pr SQL program that have absolutely opposite semantics. SQL does not maintain any visible distinctions between these two foreign keys, one of which represents a relation and another one doesn't. 
you know, problems are piling up. It's only fifth slide and we already have four problems. But there are more. We have inheritance. In modern databases, class inheritance is intended to represent a relation between relations. So a high order relation such as a class belong to another class is represented by inheritance. And on top of it we have complex types which are in fact also a representation of a higher order relations. Here's a snippet from Oracle documentation. It defines a collection and it is lexically it is literally indistinguishable from a definition of a table. And even in, a, even in the documentation in the same chapter, they call collections nested tables. Tables represent relations. Nesting of the tables represent higher order relations, relations between relations. So that a complex type be it a collection or array or something else, whatever you call it, it is still a representation of a relation. So we end up with a representation zoo of at least five different representations for the same thing, which is motivated, which is motivated by the impossibility of SQL to represent relations between relations. So relations between basic types called tables are perfectly representable and everything else, relations between tables, we have to build up some other surrogate representations on top of SQL. And this, this piling up of different representations presents a real problem in its own plus it creates additional problems that lead to drop of performance. Starting with the link table, here's the link table. It represents three relations by creating five relations within, um, within, a, data, within a physical database. So five, rela five relations in terms of of the database represent three relations in in real knowledge in in the, in the domain knowledge two more unwanted relations they are destined to re to lower to decrease to decrease the performance of the database in two ways way number 1 we want to select genres of a given book, which is, you can guess, the most basic operation that you can address to this particular uh, data scheme. You have a data scheme of books linked to genres. So your most basic operation is to select genres of a given book. And it is necessary to make a join of three tables. It's a triple join. The most basic operation is a triple join already. And you know joins are not cheap. Joins probably the most costly operations <laughs> next to sequential scans maybe. But you get the gist. But there is more. What is going mathematically speaking, inside this triple join. Here's our problem, our initial problem. We have a relation book genre, which is by definition a subset of the Cartesian product of book and genre. So somewhere here on this two-dimensional plane exists the entirety of our book genre relation and we are searching for several points inside it. It's a fundamentally a two-dimensional search. And what does the join do? The join doubles our search space. 
by making a Cartesian, by performing a Cartesian product of the book genre space with the book genre itself. A join is a Cartesian product, but in our case, in our most basic case, in, in our unavoidable case, it is a perfectly meaningless Cartesian product. It just doubles the search space and instead of two-dimensional search, we do four-dimensional search. On top of that, not only with link tables, in every case of a join, a join is meant to create a relation, but every time the resulting relation already exists. Here, take a look at the one-to-many relation. Our very first example. Here, when we select category of an item, we join two tables by their foreign key, where foreign key represents a relation. What does it mean? It means that this join is employed to convert a representation of a relation from one representation into another representation, from yellow to white on this picture. So, join merely converts representations and nothing else. But the worst part of it, it does it repetitively. You have to join this table each time you are accessing the information about the foreign key. Each time you access this highlighted in yellow relation, each time you access this yellow relation on this picture, you have to recalculate its representation because in its original form, as it is stored in your database, it is not readable. So, first, every pair of tables you ever join, you made them joinable. Your job is to make all the joins to your database perfectly predictable. You fail at making them predictable, you lose the bonus, you are a failure of a programmer. So that no join will create any new information and it is your responsibility to make it so. So that your job as a programmer is to make joins useless. But still, you have to call them every time you access information that is represented as non-tables, as foreign keys or link tables. Or in order to recalculate the representation of the relation, which makes every join, a job of every join, a Sisyphus's job, absolutely Sisyphus's job. So let's recap the flaws of SQL, those that I just listed and some more. Costly, unnecessary joins, repetitive, useless job. Representation zoo, this mess of representations that causes all of it. Human language mimicking, inconsistent, inextensible, needlessly complicated syntax. You know it, I don't need to remind you. Mixing relational operations with the output formatting, it's more difficult, keep it in mind and you will, you will see what I mean when I'm going to explain my proposal. Imperative DDL, horrible thing, non idempotent You call create a database, no, no, create table, call create table twice. First time it says, okay, created. Second time it throws a year, an error. Nothing changed, uh, error state changed. You didn't change input, but this input produces different results. non idempotent DDL, horrible stuff, should be declarative. 
impossibility of relations between relations, we just discussed it, and separation from the application layer language, the great divide, in which SQL itself partially responsible to. So, the problem is that the major necessity of life in SQL, your, your core, the, the center, the center of, of your SQL program, joins, they are useless. 90% of the work that your database is doing every day is merely conversion of the representations of relations. And your most important interest in SQL, your need for SQL, representation of relations is not satisfied because, well, because SQL is not capable of representing higher order relations. We will discuss it in, in, in more details, but it constitutes, this impossibility constitutes our first instrumental goal. We need a language that is capable of representing higher order relations without creating a representation zoo, without creating a need for conversion of representations, different representations of relations. Here's what we have with SQL. Here's our initial hierarchy of relations that we started with. It represents some piece of real life knowledge. And when you try to translate this piece of knowledge into SQL database, first you have to choose exactly one layer of this hierarchy to be represented by means of tables. Once you have chosen it, once you, once you have represented a single item as a table, you cannot represent relations above and below it by means of tables. You need to use something else. Because tables don't nest naturally in SQL. So you employ foreign keys and link tables for higher order relations and you have several quite useful by now mechanisms of complex types and subtypes and field constraints for representing lower level relations. Now this is the illustration of fundamental impossibility of uniform representation of everything in SQL. Uh, apologies for this slide. For the sake of completeness we must state our definitions. So every time referring to a relation I mean a strictly defined mathematical relation which is a subset of a Cartesian product of its domains. From this definition immediately follows a very obvious fact that a relation can be a domain of another relation. And SQL does not reflect this fact. When you Specify a relation in terms of SQL, which is traditionally a table, you are limited to basic types. The domain of an SQL relation could only be a basic type. Such is this language. You cannot specify another table as a domain of a table. And this fact, the fact that a relation is a set and therefore can be a domain of another relation, this is specifically what makes relational database, what makes relational model, what makes relational model so powerful and so all-encompassing. 
specifically because of that. Whatever you speak about, every every part of speech, basically, every part of speech is a relation. And most of them, the vast majority of them, are higher order relations. In every in every snippet of real knowledge, most of the relations are higher order relations, so that SQL fails to satisfy the primary need of representing knowledge. Uh, what do we need to do? We need to make a language where a relation can be represented uniformly, regardless of its order. So everything on this picture should be represented uniformly, homogeneously. Transitioning to linguistic terms, we need a language that satisfies this simple closure, where domain of a relation could be a relation, highlighted here in white. And this problem immediately splits into two sub-problems. How to reflect this fact in the data storage and how to speak in a data language that allows this fact. Because our goal of a language is to speak it. So we, we, need, uh, we need speech about such complex relations. We need to make a language that makes a speech about higher order relations readable. But first, let's focus on the first part, data storage. Is it possible to map these fantasies, this philosophical lament I just expressed, is it possible to map it into concrete reality, into, into a physical data storage? Yes, it is possible. And uh, this picture shows us what do we call a graph of a relation? All these yellow legs between keys of domains A and B, this is the graph of a relation. If we are able to represent this, this graph, we represented the relation raw. So the, the problem of representing arbitrary Ab arbitrary relation raw between two other arbitrary relations A and B is the problem of representing the graph of the relation raw. And this is how we solve it. As long as we index domains A and B, we can represent the graph as a finite set of integers. We can represent it as a finite set of tuples of uh, couples of integers, but a finite set of a finite set of couples of integers can always be represented as a finite set of integers. That's a mathematical fact. So a finite set of integers is always a representation of the graph of this arbitrary relation. And nothing is easier than indexing a finite set of integers. And once we build this index, we suddenly discover that we just represented an arbitrary higher order relation without invoking any mathematical miracles, without invoking new software, without invoking any breakthrough in data science. An ordinary index is capable of representing a higher order relation if we allow it to refer to more than one data node per leaf. This leaf, the leaves of this index, they refer to two data nodes each. But is it really a complication? Once you have machinery to maintain indexes, the problem is already solved.
you just need to allow allow an index to be a multi-table index a multi-table index itself is a relation between relations that's it and let us reiterate this proof because it was constructive and I hate constructive proofs and I feel that many of you also hate constructive proofs so make sure that these relations A and B are arbitrary, arbitrary relations uh, throughout our proof we did not imply any specific properties except being indexable which is which is a must to have anyway and thus we finish we end up with a comfortable representation of a higher order relation that is already implementable right now so you can see that the philosophical lament I started with translates into perfectly actionable idea like more than actionable it's almost done already but it takes one one tiny step not in the field of software but in the field of mental models it takes a taboo breach and a paradigm shift you must forget about tables drop them Tables aren't relations. Indexes are relations. Indexes represent what belongs, what doesn't belong, and where it is located physically. And now we can move on to building the language. So we solved our physical problem. We solved the problem of pre representation. Now we are about to solve the problem of speaking. So first, we must drop altogether human language mimicking. It led SQL into oblivion. Uh, I would like to maintain the separation between relational operations and data output formatting. I would like to maintain a single separator, be it the space, and drop all semicolons and commas and drop the entire idea of something being in between which simplifies the language dramatically I want to make basic types and relations interchangeable this is the key part this is the key part a definition of a relation is not limited to basic types accepted as the relation domains a definition of a relation should accept other relations as domains simple as that it satisfies this requirement of uh, homogeneous uh, uniform representation variables and assignments the language must be must allow and maybe focused or build around assignments variables well immutable variables very nice oxymoron I know immutable variables why because it's a it's a high demand presently in SQL this um, control structure this with the clause with is just a weird way to define assignments within SQL they are in high demand already so we cannot escape them and we shouldn't try make data management return value shame on Oracle for very ugly very shameful clause uh, returning returning is a shame it shouldn't work like that I would like to maintain functional purity and keep basic types as few as possible speaking of basic types here's my 
basic types system for the proposed language. It contains six types, two of which are absolute novelty, time and time interval. I call it pragmatic typization because this type system is it's not a complete system okay it's the basic layer of the type system it is dictated by the capacity of these types to represent ideas in real world the distinction between each of these two types presented on this slide represents some meaningful distinction in real world. The distinction between each of these two types does not represent a distinction of data representation in the memory of a machine. We must forget about machine memory and concentrate on the properties of knowledge that we are trying to represent and these six types they represent meaningfully distinct types that 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 you see in real world and forget about memory the first class data object in our language is set of tuples even if it is a scalar, scalar like even if it is a number, it is still treatable as a set of tuples. You can put a scalar in the set of tuple context and it will be treated as a set of tuple. Not necessarily the bloat memory dedicated for each scalar to be a memory dedicated to a set of tuples, but on the surface level for a user everything should be treatable as a set of tuples and as we discussed above a relational model is all-encompassing it is capable of representing anything and this capability stems from utilization of two categorically distinct categories of collections tuples and sets for some mathematical reason or magic not reason i don't care one is not sufficient you cannot represent anything any knowledge by using only one type of collections but if you have two distinct types of collections as long as they are distinct, you are capable to represent absolutely everything. So all possible knowledge, all possible data objects of arbitrary complexity, they occur on this two-dimensional plane, tuples and sets, if we allow for arbitrary, for arbitrary complexity, for arbitrary nesting. On the other hand, if we add a third category of collection, it will be redundant. I will show it later. So, a few more boring slides. The lexic of the language. I'm trying to make it also as simple as possible. We have seven literals, four pairs of brackets and two separators. Two separators because we equate line breaks with spaces four brackets because we have two-dimensional plane tuples and sets uh, tuple brackets they complicate things they build up a tuple projection brackets they dismantle a tuple union brackets they build up a set selection brackets they dismantle a set four fundamental directions on a, a two-dimensional plane. They are represented with brackets in our language. And literals are quite typical, seven of them. Uh, we maintain 
distinction between capitalized and non-capitalized identifiers for no philosophical reason, but it increases readability greatly. So, so much it increases readability, it is worth having. For no other reason than readability. We extend number literal in Erlangish style because it's very useful, very comfortable. And we introduce a novelty, a time literal. It's a literal, it's a quoted literal and special quotes. It represents constants of types time and time interval. It represents a calendar date to arbitrary granularity or time or interval between two calendar dates. Brand new thing, very important, simplifies everything. Of course we have operators, pretty standard, nothing new. And we maintain as few keywords as possible. Six keywords and nine semi-keywords. Finally, the first example of the language itself. Here's the, defini here's the data definition. Uh, the scheme above. Okay, this entity relation diagram above is equivalent to the definition below. So you can look at it and find the and discover the simplicity of the language. How simple it is to write down this not way not not very complicated yet containing three many to many relations uh, database is very simple to write down. Well, you can imagine how simpler than SQL, much simpler. But the most important part, the three uh, three bottom lines, author, book genre, and available, they are higher order relations, and they are defined by using the same language we define tables. So you can think about book and writer and genre as tables and still they are represented uniformly with higher order relations very simple surprisingly simple i have no idea why nobody did it before Uh, domain and relation, uh, these keywords. Why do we have two keywords for a relation? Basically, a domain is a relation and relation is also a relation. But we maintain two keywords. Why? Domain is a special relation that contains all of its possible tuples. If you have a relation, a user defines what tuples belong to this relation. You can add and remove from this relation. A domain is a special case of a relation where you cannot add, neither, neither remove anything because everything always belongs to it. It plays a role of a complex type and it helps us to add structure to our tuples. It also connects to the idea of pragmatic typization because it represents ideas. It represents ideas of the domain knowledge with types. Here's the grammar of data definition. Uh, I, ex I took only three lines from the example above, from the previous example, to illustrate the grammar below. Yes, this is that simple. The, the data definition grammar contains of seven lines. Uh, pay attention to this symbol. Uh, where is my mouse pointer? Uh, this symbol with three dots. Uh, I invented it in violation of BNF. It means a list of. 
So domains is a list of domain. It's just for brevity. So in order to define a relation, you say I define a relation and provide a tuple that describes this relation, which is name and the list of domains. And the list of domains accepts basic types or relation names interchangeably. These two bottom lines, they are synonymous in linguistic terms. In terms of defining the language, these lines are synonymous, but I made them duplicate in order to highlight the fact that basic types are interchangeable with relation names. So types you define are interchangeable with types that are defined before you. The predefined types and user-defined types are completely interchangeable. Constructors. Another fundamental object of a language. How do we complicate things? How do we create these collections of data? Tuples. We use tuple brackets to combine elements into a tuple. And pay attention to the bottom line, type name. In addition to combining elements into a tuple, we provide an opportunity to specify type name. A constructor ensures type of this tuple. You can make a tuple uh, conforming to a given type. You say, I want this tuple to unify with the given type. If it unifies, constructor succeeds. If it doesn't unify, it throws an error. Very important thing, very important for programming because you make type costs with that and you make type assurance with that and also it improves readability. You can read which type this tuple is. It really improves readability. And improves readability in very meaningful sense because when you read a program in which this type specified when you run this program this type will be checked for second constructor obviously we have two two types of constructors tuple constructor and set constructor perfectly analogous we put a list of elements into set brackets and it results in a set and again in addition we provide an opportunity for type insurance you can ensure the type of the elements of the set so you can make in addition to ensure the type you can ensure the homogeneity of the set that this is not a set of elements of different types this is the set of same type elements and obviously we reuse constructors as set operations because a tuple is naturally a Cartesian product of its elements and a set is naturally a union of its elements so it would be a shame to not reuse the constructors as basic set operations. So we are settled. We have the set of basic set operations. In order to move on to more complex examples, we, have a, uh, we are going to use assignments in the, in, in the following examples. So we need to understand assignments. Well, I am open for suggestions. If you suggest to change the sign of assignments, I'm fine with that. Wh whatever sign you like. Uh, I'm not in love with particular characters. But it needs to be directional because 
we allow for prefix and postfix assignments as well. And postfix assignments are here for sole purpose of increasing readability. And they do increase readability massively in case of multi in case of multi-line expressions. If you have a huge multi-line select with subselects and everything, you'd better have postfix assignment because it is more convenient to see the name of the value right where you type and not above your screen. And also, again, complementing the idea of pragmatic typization, assigning a name to a value is not a memory operation. Nothing is a memory operation here. It is just assigning a name to a value to refer to it by name. Selections. Well, we are moving on to the center of the language. When you write in SQL select asterisk, what information does this sentence contain? Right, one word. The only actionable information that this sentence contains is the name of the type and nothing else. So we write in our language just that. In our language we select from book by putting it inside selection brackets. That's it. But because we need more than select asterisk in our everyday life, you can also complement this selection brackets with a pattern. A pattern according to which you filter the contents, the tuples of the given relation. And this pattern, please ignore the functional, this bottom section. It is here for completeness. It works. But the more we are going to talk about conjunctions and disjunctions here. A pattern can be a nested, a nested conjunction disjunction. It is a combination of patterns so that this system is complete because it allows you to express arbitrarily complex combination of conjunctions and disjunctions. and brackets. Brackets are chosen here. It's not a coincidence. The reuse of these brackets has its own deep philosophical meaning. I hope you can see it. Here are the examples of selections. Here we select documents from the table writer. writer Okay, you can read it. I, it wouldn't be useful for me to simply read what is typed on the screen. So, only comments. Uh, the third and fourth lines, they, they show us that we can use that we can select from from a named value we can we can reuse named values as objects to select from equivalently we can do subselects we can combine we can split a pattern into two subselects in second and third line or combine the pattern into a single pattern on the fourth line and the two last lines, the X, the X lines, they show us the equivalency between a disjunctive pattern and the union of a result of two independent selects. 
So no matter where you put these brackets see, inside the selection or outside the selection, you have this equivalency. So you can understand the logic why these type of brackets are used. And I already said the word unification. Selection is based on pattern unification. And fun function calls are based on unification. And type casts are also based on unification. So unification is a center of this language. And it is significantly improved over Prolog and Erlang unifications. Well, first we get rid of the positional reference. Our tuples are non-positional. Our tuples are tuples of named elements. This is the first line of the example. Shows us that the type domain unifies with the first, the, with the first tuple in this example. So it ignores the order. It also unifies the last element as long as it unifies unambiguously you can drop the name at the last element for brevity. And the next step of abbreviating the tuple is abbreviating the names itself. We allow to abbreviate the name down to a single letter as long as this abbreviation is unambiguous. This is very important. It's novel. It's a novelty. And it is very important because it divorces two mutually exclusive, two competing demands. Uh, in a normal language, you you have to satisfy two competing demands. You need your names, you need your labels, you need your argument, function arguments names to be mnemonic, to be explanatory. In order for a name to be explanatory, it needs to be lengthy. But you don't like to type lengthy names, especially in the context of a single tuple, of a single function call, because it, it is already clear what you are typing. So by allowing abbreviations, we s divorce these two requirements so that you can satisfy them both at the same time. You are allowed to have names as lengthy as you, as you will and at the same time refer to these names as briefly as you will. And another significant improvement of our unification is that we allow types and labels to be used for unification, although names override types. But it, it feels so natural. I don't even need to I don't even feel the need to explain it to you because it's so obvious. You can unify elements of a tuple by their names. Or, if you don't have names, lower order, you can unify them by their types. And also, if you drop the name in the definition, then the element will inherit the name of its type. The name of, of the type will become virtually the name of the tuple element. It is also a it is also a source of brevity and convenience, and it's fantastic. So, we absolutely removed positional reference from our language. Wonderful. I like it. And the next step is this small part, this selection, person, young... Younger person from from table person. It's a part of a previous example. If you didn't pay attention to that, pay it now. We said select from relation person those tuples 
whose birth date is earlier than 1990. This what this selection says literally that and it reads like normal English and it looks like human language mimicking we are trying to abolish. But it is not human language mimicking. Uh, look, earlier is a name. It is user-defined name. Then is also a user-defined name. Uh, here, maybe I, I should invoke my mouse pointer. This function definition. Read this function definition. We define the function earlier as a function with arguments labeled a and then. So that this effect, this natural English text flow, is a result of a decision made by a, a programmer. It's, it is not a result of the axioms of the language. Axioms of the language remain agnostic about English language. But a well-designed language allows a programmer to make decisions for increased readability of his program. Because natural language has the same ultimate source, human brain. And I hope you appreciate, I hope you deeply appreciate uh, the choice of, of the part of speech. I think that preposition then perfectly fits the, the, the very, the part of speech preposition fits the role of a label of a function argument. So choose, choose your identifiers carefully and you will produce naturally readable texts. Uh, uh, okay, I repeat the examples. Here you can see this birth date earlier than example again within a scope of a bigger example. No, not not I inside the context. And finally, the fourth part, projections. So we, decide, we discussed how to complicate things in two directions, how to decomplicate things with select, and we complete this system with projections to decomplicate tuples, to decompose, dismantle tuples. Uh, the grammar, the grammar of projections is that simple. It is a complete grammar of projections, four lines of B and F. <laughs> so, you put expression and the list of fields inside projection brackets and you produce a projection. The example on top of it shows that you can use assignments to decouple your selects or or decouple projections. You can, opposite to that, nest projections one into another. And the last line are assignments show you that there is a possibility to access a deeper nested levels of, of your tuple within a single projection. And you probably notice that Dot notation seems unnatural for this style of language, but this is this is the specific place where dot notations where where the dot notation feels natural. It it seems like at home. This is where dot notation should be used, and this is the only place where dot notation should have ever been used. And once we completed our data language in the sense of constructing cont constructing expressions, so we can we can connect we can construct tuples and sets of a of any given type in a manner that is complete. 
so any arbitrary tuple can be constructed and this tuple contains information about its type and therefore data management grammar is that trivial we simply add a command add remove or update to a to an expression and that's it so we don't need to say well take a look at the first example add book title 1984 we don't need to tell explicitly where to add a book the only place where you can add a book is a book so the information as to insert uh, add we, we use it add because it's not insert in sql it is insert into where so where is already known you don't have to specify it so what is data management data management takes an expression and either adds it or removes it or replaces it in case of replace it takes two expressions it replaces one with another uh, element by element because these are the sets it also automatically solves the problem of multiple inserts simply by by providing a set of tuples inst instead of a single tuple and of course data management operations return values this is very convenient if you don't need a value to be returned drop it but if you need it you don't have to do any magic any special you don't have to complicate your code you don't have to write anything specific in order to uh, retrieve the value and we remove the joints we put joints out of the job we don't need them so we don't have them but We are willing to compensate you for this loss. We are willing to provide you an operation that is called connection. You can literally connect two arbitrary relations as long as they are connected according to the data definition. If the data scheme contains a path between two relations from one relation to another it is possible for the machine to find out this path to calculate this path to know what to do in order to produce the result that is required to satisfy this connection command in this example I want to select all writers that have written in genre bore I could do this explicitly manually by hand or I can use the machine to do the job for me because this job is algorithmically solvable it, it is not a it is not a job for a human to calculate paths in a graph another sweetie composite types our language doesn't have nulls well because we don't need them but we are willing to compensate you for this loss if you still feel an itch to squeeze some metadata inside your data you can define a composite type this example represents the most common use case for nulls or composite types in our case let's say you have a database of some clients and you record their da birth dates but some of them refuse to provide birth dates and you write down this person refused to provide his birth date so that the type of this field is either birth date or some arbitrary text some arbitrary excuse for not having this birth date 
do it is doable by means of composite types a composite type is a con is a disjunctive type here's the grammar from this grammar alone you can get the idea what is from this grammar alone you can you, you get the idea what is a disjunctive type is elements of these types are members of either one type or another type it's like a set of types more abstract examples but more but better I, th this example is very common but I hate it and these two examples are very abstract but more elegant and I don't hate them for example you can have a type literature genre which is a disjunction of types prose genre or poetry genre so you can select from literature genre members of two underlying classes of genre without making distinction between them composite types are fantastic Grouping and aggregation is an important and necessary part of, of your life, but it's easily achievable by adding a single character to our projection brackets. So when you remember SQL, you ask yourself, what specific information does the group by closure contain? The group by closure contain a split a split in the list of fields so this character this backslash in our grouping brackets represents this split we group some fields according to other fields so nothing else we only needed this information we represented this information in writing and we doesn't we, we don't need anything else Here's the example of grouping. It is not yet aggregation, but it is a necessary step. And since we already have means to define functions acting on a set as a fold, and we have means to decompose structures or apply functions to arbitrary elements of arbitrary complex data structures we can apply aggregation function later on if we achieved grouping so once we achieved grouping the aggregation operation becomes becomes trivial so the problem solved at this point at this point we achieved grouping and the aggregation is automatically solved speaking of automagic not in the same sense automatically uh, first very trivial thing we don't have higher order function map because all functions by default behave as maps but we still need we still need to maintain a distinction between functions acting as a map and functions acting on a set as a whole we call them folding functions and we provide specific means of explicitly defining a function as a folding function so this is how we do that move on auto distinct uh, we treat sets as proper mathematical sets duplicates have no meaning they don't represent real life knowledge so we make we drop duplicates always we reduce depth of nesting automatically if this nesting does not represent any useful information according to the doctrine of pragmatic typization a tuple of a single tuple is meaningless so we drop it we reduce the depth 
a set of sets also remember we reuse set operations as unions is meaningless it contains no pragmatic information it, it represents no information in terms of the domain knowledge so we also drop it we out of flatten sets of sets however if you have some idea as to why to have a set of sets express this idea explicitly within your data structure add another element to this tuple make it visible that the, there is a distinction so that a reader of your program sees it doesn't have to imply it he reads it and also the machine reads it and sees oh yeah there, there is a distinction there is some information we cannot drop this information so this out of flattening after reduction of depth is not an obstacle for you as a programmer just don't imply meaning express it explicitly and nothing will be dropped nothing will be flattened out of flatten feature this automatic reduction of depth enables typecasts we envelop we envelop a value of one type into a tuple of another type type changes depth reduced brackets dro type changes dra brackets dropped that's the first positive side of outer reduction of depth the second more important positive side of automatic reduction of the depth this is the Erlang example it shows us that having a third category of collecting elements arity essentially we have two categories of collections tuples sets and then comes in arity and arity is a third category of collections and we already represented everything we needed by using two of them and from this Erlang example, you can see that you can simply drop RIT brackets and nothing change. Nothing changes if you replace RIT with tuples or sets. Either one of them works just as good. So you do not need RIT. Two categories of collections are sufficient. And this is how it maps into our language. We can select author by providing a, a list of appropriate filters or by providing a tuple of appropriate filters. And it still produces the same result. And this result is a tuple of the type author. And if we feed if we feed the select result as a pattern into this very select it produces the same result so with automatic reduction of depth we achieved idempotence of selections look at the last line selections are idempotent over its patterns if we use a result of a selection as a pattern, nothing changes. This is wonderful. This is fantastic. This is wow. If you are not amazed with that, I have no idea how to amaze you. Conclusion. Pragmatic typization. General purpose language integration. You can see this language is simple. It speaks about very complex, very deep, very nested structures in a very quote-unquote linear manner. So it is very condu conducive of integrating into a normal text flow of a normal language, functional preferably. Completeness, it is complete. Conciseness, purity homogeneity. Thank you for your attention.